speak to us a word of life. Help us to listen clearly. Help us to understand it. Help us to to see what it is you're calling us to do. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Leviticus chapter 3. Uh, we're in this series that we've just started uh, called Worshiping a Holy God. And, uh, and uh, this morning, uh, I've entitled this sermon, Dinner with God. So Leviticus chapter 3, make your way there. We'll read that sacred text in just a moment. Um, but let me, let me help to make a connection between... The, the season of Advent, the celebration of the Lord coming into the world to save, and this ancient book, which seems not at all the place one would go to to celebrate Christmas. These instructions from these different sacrifices in ancient uh, Israel. Well, let's think of maybe a text um, that, that more quickly leaps to your mind at Christmas time. Luke chapter 2. In that chapter, so frequented uh, at this time of year, um, Luke records a spectacular event. One we, one we celebrate, and, and we could almost uh, uh, quote it maybe word for word. Even, uh, even uh, we hear Linus quoting these words in uh, one of our favorite cartoons, maybe. But it's an event where a host of angels appear to shepherds in the night. The sky, as it were, rips open so that the host of heaven might declare these words in Luke 2, verse 14. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Glory to God in the highest, and peace on earth. Why did the birth of Jesus Christ elicit this kind of praise, friends? And why did the angel speak of peace that might be experienced here in this world because he came into it? Well, for that answer, we have to go back to the very beginning. God made man, all of us, in his image. We read of that in Genesis chapter 1. He did this so that we might bring him glory as we lived out his purposes in the world. That we might reflect his goodness, for example, and his beauty across the globe as we submitted to him as our king and walked before him in joyful obedience. This is living in peace with God, in fullness of purpose, in the great joy of being in fellowship with the Lord. It was the creation purpose. It's seen in the, in the beginning, in, in God living with Adam and Eve in the, in the lush garden world that he had made for them. Listen to the words he spoke to them at the beginning of time when he was with them. Listen carefully here. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 28. God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of of all the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. Friends, what a beautiful just snapshot at the beginning of time. God living with man. Man living in a paradise with God that he had prepared for them. A life of peace as it was designed to be. But sin shattered all of that. Man was expelled from the garden because of Adam's treason. Man was separated from God, condemned to live away from him in a world cursed by sin. Man's life from that point forward was characterized by trouble and fear, chaos and stress, futility and strife, sickness, and eventually death. 
Having rejected God and his good rule, man was no longer in harmony with God. And so we see mankind at odds with the Lord as we read through the Bible. It's the regular theme. We see God not rejoicing over man, but un unleashing his holy anger upon their sin. We read of God annihilating the world through the flood in Genesis 6. We read of God slaughtering the Exodus generation in the wilderness for their disobedience. We read of him opening the ground to swallow up those who rebelled against the man he had appointed to lead them in Moses. We read of God bringing his just wrath upon Israel over and over again through sending foreign armies into the promised land, people like the Assyrians and the Babylonians, for example, example, even eventually ripping them from the land he had promised their forefathers and sending them into exile. Men throughout history do not know God. Most men. They serve false gods and they deny their creator's existence stirring up his hot anger against them. And that is a terrible story if it ends there. But we also know that God is consistently showing mercy to sinners. Praise his name. He's consistently showing great patience with those who oppose him, sending prophets to call them to come back to him, deliverers to rescue them from their enemies, to release them finally from exile. We read of, read of God as a savior who over and over again makes a way for sinners to come back to, to God, to come back to him, to experience peace that harkens back to how it was in the beginning in creation, in the garden. We read of God's Son coming into the world to save sinners and to restore them to fellowship with God. Peace on earth, as the angels had sung to the shepherds. Friends, this text that we're about to read, about to examine, about to set our hearts upon, teaches us that God forgives so that we might have peace with him. Simple but profound truth. God forgives so that we might have peace with him. So as we approach God's word, I would just ask you, where do you find yourself today? Do you find yourself at peace with God? Are you experiencing his peace today? Or do you live your days mostly in frustration, not knowing what your purpose is, groping around trying to find a reason for you being in this world? Do you feel far from God? Do you live oftentimes frustrated? Do you try not to think about the day you will meet him? Are you worried about what you will say to him about all the wrong that you've done in your life? That doesn't sound like peace. Peace. Well, wherever you find yourself today, pay careful attention to God's word as he speaks to us on this very topic from Leviticus chapter 3. Let me read it for you. If his offering is a sacrifice of peace offering, if he offers an animal from the herd, male or female, he shall offer it without blemish before the Lord. And he shall lay his hand on the head of his offering and kill it at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And Aaron's sons, the priests, shall throw the blood against the sides of the altar. And from the sacrifice of the peace offering as a food offering to the Lord, he shall offer the fat covering the entrails and all the fat that's on the entrails, and the two kidneys with the fat that is on them at the loins, and the long lobe of the liver that he shall remove with the kidneys." Then Aaron's son shall burn it on the altar, on the top of the burnt offering, which is on the wood on the fire. It is a food offering with a pleasing aroma to the Lord. If his offering for a sacrifice of peace offering to the Lord is an animal from the flock, male or female, he shall offer it without blemish. 
If he offers a lamb for his offering, then he shall offer it before the Lord. Lay his hand on the head of his offering and kill it in front of the tent of meeting, and Aaron's son shall throw its blood against the sides of the altar. Then from the sacrifice of the peace offering, he shall offer as a food offering to the Lord its fat. He shall remove the whole fat tail cut off close to the backbone and the fat that covers the entrails and all the fat that is on the entrails and the two kidneys with the fat that is on them at the loins and the long lobe of the liver that he shall remove with the kidneys and the priest shall burn it on the altar as a food offering to the Lord. If his offering is a goat, then he shall offer it before the Lord and lay his hand on its head and kill it in front of the tent of meeting and the sons of Aaron shall throw its blood against the sides of the altar. Then he shall offer from it as his offering for a food offering to the Lord, the fat covering the entrails and all the fat that's on the entrails and the two kidneys with the fat that's on them at the loins and the long lobe of the liver that he shall remove with the kidneys. And the priest shall burn them on the altar as a food offering with a pleasing aroma. All fat is the Lord's. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwelling places that you eat neither fat nor blood. Okay. Keep your mind focused on the theme of this text that I aim to, 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 to prove to you, that God forgives so we might enjoy peace with him. God forgives so that we might enjoy peace with him. And that ongoing powerful remembrance of peace is seen in this offering that we're talking about this morning, the peace offering, sometimes called the fellowship offering, depending on which translation of the Bible you're reading. This is now the third chapter and the third offering that we've looked at in this book. There are many festivals and feasts that Israel celebrated on specific days that were required. For example, the Feast of the Tabernacles or the Passover Festival. And there are also daily sacrifices offered by the priests that are spelled out in the law, like the burnt offering offered every morning and evening. There were also weekly Sabbath offerings and the like. But the offerings at the beginning of this book, the burnt offering we looked at in chapter 1, the, the uh, grain offering in chapter 2, and now uh, the peace offering here in chapter 3, these are occasional offerings. They're, they're offerings that are, are, are brought to the altar because an Israel, Israelite felt like they wanted to do so. They felt the necessity, for example, to thank God or to mark a special occasion in one's spiritual life or to enjoy, uh, uh, just to celebrate the ongoing fellowship they had with the Lord. So the peace offering here is not commanded, but rather encouraged. And it had its own meaning, meaning in the life of Israel's worship, its own distinct purposes. The burnt offering was to atone for sins. The grain offering was to dedicate oneself again to the Lord. But the peace offering, the peace offering was to celebrate no longer being God's enemy. Think of that. Think of that occasion for an offering. No longer being God's enemy. God forgives so we might enjoy peace with him. And so we now turn to the offering that celebrates that grand reality. As we look at the Word of God today, let us consider first the source of peace with God. They're all S's. Hopefully you can hook yourself to them. The source of peace with God. Secondly, the substance of the peace offering. And third, the savoring of peace. That the, people, that the people engaged in as they brought the offering. Source substance, savoring. That's how we'll walk through Leviticus chapter 3 today. So let's take them one at a time. First, let us consider the source of peace from God. Where did the Israelites acquire this peace? How is it that peace came to them specifically? There's something that must come first for one to enjoy peace with God. It's, it's not the first move. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's something that, that is produced from something else. Peace with God only comes as a result of, of your sin being atoned for. 
That is a sacrifice that, is, that covers your sins metaphorically in God's eyes because it at least temporarily satisfies God's need for justly punishing your sins. So where does peace come from? What's its source? Peace comes as a result of forgiveness. That's where it's derived. Sin is the great ugly barrier between God and man. I spoke of it. I I sort of gave you a, 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 a history timeline of it in the introduction. Sin is what brings chaos and enmity, that state of being an enemy with God. Before sins are covered, before forgiveness uh, is extended, men live in shame and terror, and so no peace. Because deep down, even if they deny it, even if they deny God's existence, they know from the creation around them, they know that there is a God who made them and the world that they will have to answer to. And their conscience also bears witness that they sin against God. Forgiveness and peace go hand in hand. This is why the portion of the peace offering that is placed on the altar is often made in conjunction with the burnt offering. Look at verse 5 there, the first half of the verse. Aaron's son shall burn it on the altar on top of the burnt offering. Well, what was the burnt offering? The burnt offering was for atonement. It was so that that people's sins might be covered. By God's grace, he had made a way for sinners to be reconciled to him in worship through the burnt offering. Instead of requiring a man to pay for his own sins and so be separated forever from God, he allowed an animal to stand as a sinner's substitute to have its life offered in the stead of the man who brought it. God showed his grace to Israel by accepting animal sacrifices as pleasing to him, resulting in acceptance of sinners who were previously out of relationship with God. Notice chapter 1 and verse 3. Flip back a couple of pages. Speaking of the burnt offering, he shall bring it to the entrance of the tent of meeting that he may be accepted before the Lord. Peace flows from forgiveness. And so the sinner's acceptance in that burnt offering is echoed as the peace offering is burned on top of it. Look again at verse 5, now the second part. It is a food offering, this peace offering. It is a food offering with a pleasing aroma to the Lord. I don't know if you would describe peace as a smell, But if you did, it would be that, wouldn't it? A pleasing aroma, right? God is pleased here, not angry. He graciously forgives in in the acceptance of a substitute sacrifice. A necessary and glorious implication of that forgiveness from God is peace with God. We have to see this connection. God pours out his anger for sin on the animal, leaving the sinner to enjoy now no more anger, but rather his peace, the peace that comes from forgiveness, from being accepted, from being welcomed into God's presence. And so God's portion of the peace offering is placed on top of that burnt offering. They're offered together. The two offerings are connected at the deepest levels. So too is forgiveness and peace. That's why I say God forgives so we might enjoy peace with him. Well, that's just the basics of coming to Christ, isn't it? We come to Christ, we, 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 we repent of our sins, and as it were, we don't offer Christ to God, but rather trust in Christ that has already been offered to God. And as a result of that, we're forgiven, and we enjoy that peace. But one can never forget that forgiveness and that resulting peace comes through the death of another. I've mentioned this idea of substitute, and that's what we're referring to here. That's what we're thinking about. 
So while the blood of the burnt offering is the payment for a man's sin, we talked about that in chapter 1, more and more burnt offerings are required for their ongoing sins. That burnt offering is just brought again and again. The priest would bring it to serve generally for the people twice a day. But you, as you were, as you were feeling the weight and shame of your sin, you would be inspired to bring your own just, just free will burnt offering. Even as a man offers the peace offering, He's reminded that peace comes at a high price because of the ongoing violence even in the peace offering. It's a bloody death that, that pays for sins so that peace can be enjoyed. And, it's, and, and the worshiper is reminded of this again and again. Verse 2 tells us the worshiper places his hand on the head of the animal as he slits its throat. Imagine that for a moment. That's your worship. That's you coming to celebrate having peace with God because he's forgiven you. And while you're doing that, you're cutting the throat of this animal that you have brought. The blood pouring from its fatal wound is then collected by the priest and thrown against the sides of the altar that already have all of the blood from the burnt offering thrown up against it. Forgiveness brings peace, but we must remember that forgiveness... And that peace that comes from it is costly. We looked at how gruesome the burnt offerings were in chapter 1, and now we're reminded of it, ironically, in the peace offering. Peace through death. This was woven into the conscience of our forefathers because of God's wisdom in making these regulations to these sacrifices. It was woven into the conscience of those early worshipers. But the enjoyment of the sacrifices were short-lived. Sins are covered. Peace is enjoyed. But then more sins pile up, requiring more sacrifices. And so forgiveness and the peace it affords were elusive, being, being enjoyed for, for only the briefest of times only to be lost again in the mire of, of, of sin compounding and, 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 and the, the ensuing separation that sin brings from God. But what it did, its, its insufficiencies, if you will, what those sacrifices did was foretell of a greater sacrifice that was coming. It created a longing in the hearts of the worshipers for a lasting forgiveness and enduring peace with God. That longing is satisfied when sinners place their trust not in an animal brought for sacrifice, but when they place their faith in Christ as their substitute. That's why I had Gabrielle read that rich passage from the book of Hebrews. But consider this one in Colossians 1 and verse 19. Through Christ, God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you who were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. Peace through death, but a peace that lasts. The blood of bulls and goats could never take away sins, finally. But the blood of Christ brought everlasting forgiveness, satisfied God's justice, and resulted in repentant sinners being forever seen by God as holy, blameless, the kind of people that should be in his presence and enjoy his peace. What is the source of our peace? It is a gift from God that flows from his gift of forgiveness in Jesus. It's a gift that God offers to his people at the cost of another, ultimately at the cost of the Son of God's life. This is the promise hidden in the ritual of the peace offering. God forgives so we might enjoy peace with him. 
In order to fully benefit from this life-giving truth, we first looked at the source of peace with God, and now we turn our attention to the substance of the offering that celebrates that peace. We, we sort of crawl back into ancient Israel, where the tabernacle was, was set up. And, and daily the Israelites would go and offer the peace offering. Let's look at the substance of that offering that celebrates peace with God. As in the burnt offering, God prescribes different animals that could be offered here in our text. An animal from the herd, like a bull, that's the front end of our text, and, and an animal from the flock, too, like a sheep, the middle part, or a goat, the last part of our text. That's how it's laid out. These animals, when slaughtered, were not completely burnt on the altar. They weren't killed and the whole thing thrown up there. That was the case with the first offering in chapter 1, the burnt offering. Chapter 1, verse 13, be reminded. The priest shall offer all of it and burn it on the altar. It is a burnt offering, a food offering with a pleasing aroma to the Lord. All of it for the burnt offering, but not so here with this peace offering. Nevertheless, it's important for us to appreciate that any animal that was brought was killed. I mean, I just mentioned that a moment ago. Whatever happened afterwards, the killing of it was a great sacrifice. Once killed, it could obviously no longer provide wool or, or milk or carry burdens on its back and things like that. Slaying an animal in order to eat meat was actually a relatively rare occurrence in ancient Israel. The Israelites came out of Egypt with a lot of animals. I had to go back. I, I seem to have remembered that, and I looked, and sure enough, in the account of the Exodus, in Exodus 12 and verse 38, it says, they came out with very much livestock, both flocks and herds. Isn't that interesting? And that's the very places from which these sacrifices come, the, the flocks and the herds. Nevertheless, even though they had a lot of these animals, their diet in the wilderness didn't consist of these animals. As we read about what the Israelites were eating, you know what they ate. They ate manna and quail from the Lord's hand. To sacrifice animals to him then was a great act of worshipful thanksgiving. It was a valuable gift offered to God in honor of the peace that he had afforded them. And the value of this sacrifice, like those for the burnt offering, was also seen in the quality of the animals offered. Offering them in the first place, yes, sacrifice. But also in the quality of the animals offered. The worshipers were to, to bring those without blemish. We read that phrase in verse, the second half of verse 1 and again in the second half of verse 6. You see it there? Like the grain offering, too, that which was brought to the tent of meeting was to be the best the people had to offer God. Here it was to be strong and healthy examples of the people's cattle or their sheep or their goats. The animals, only those who were whole and pure now, were of course very valuable to those owners, but they were also valuable symbols of their peace with God as they reflected on, 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 on what it meant to enjoy that peace, only something of distinct value would do. You see what I'm saying? So the sacrifice and the meaning behind the sacrifice were trying to be linked up here in these regulations. The great value of peace with God and the great value of the animal offered to celebrate that peace. To be forgiven by God is to be seen by him as without blemish, as whole and healthy. And so the animals offered had to, had to represent the people and what they were enjoying with God. But more than that, the portion offered to God on the altar was to be of the highest value too, the most significance. Look at verses 16 and 17. We'll pick it up in the middle of 16. Strange language, I know. All fat is the Lord's. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwelling places that you eat neither fat nor blood. Now, blood, we know, represents the life of the animal being sacrificed. The fat represented the choice part of an animal's meat. 
Many today value a steak that's marbled with fat, that, that heightens its taste to be the best cut of meat. The life of the sacrifice in the animal's blood and the best of the animal in its fat, this was to be the Lord's. He was the guest of honor at the celebration, if you will. He was the one who brought peace to his forgiven people. And so the worshiper would not only slaughter his own sacrifice, but he would also carefully butcher it so that, so that particular portions of the animal would go to the Lord, would be cut out and given to God in the fire of the altar, as it were. We see this in verses 3 and 4, and verses 9 and 10, and 14 and 15. And so it's a regular rhythm of the text. God gets the best. Not you, worshiper. God does. The sheep were of particular interest on this point as the breed reference. The, the, the sheep that were, that were bred in Palestine, native to that land, were broad-tailed sheep. And on the back of the, of the rear of the sheep was this huge thing that kind of looked like a tail, but it was solid fat. You have to Google it to see a picture of it. It could be, it could be uh, as heavy as 15 pounds of fat. And so the, we have this, this very detailed description of cutting it off close to the, to the tailbone and, and making sure all of, that, all of that valuable portion of the, of the sheep were, were given to the Lord. We see that in verse 9, for example. The worshipful reasoning in this text can be seen if we, if we pay attention. As the peace of God is contemplated... Its priceless blessing meditated upon. The people were to give attention to an offering worthy of such a gift. And so valuable animals were brought to the priests. And the most valuable part of the animals was sacrificed to the Lord who mercifully brought that peace to them. And before you're too far away in your mind, let me just ask you some specific questions. Apply this to you. Have you considered the amazing truth that peace with God is even possible for sinners? We watched Little Women last night as a family. And uh, one of the, the, I think it was the youngest sister, took a book, a manuscript that the older sister was writing and because she was angry with her sister, she burned it. I was horrified. I like to write, you see. And I can't imagine somebody lashing out at me like that. And I said to myself, if I were her, I would never forgive her. Consider our offenses against God. The fact that he would ever forgive us it's staggering, isn't it? Staggering. We, we, we ought to take time and meditate on this, friends. How is it even possible that sinners like you and me get to be forgiven and enjoy peace at God's hand? Before we were met by the grace of God, what were we? Paul reminds the Ephesians. Hear the, hear the beginning of Ephesians chapter 2, friends. Put yourself in these words now. You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air. That's Satan. You were following Satan. The spirit that's now at work in the sons of disobedience. Among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. That was you, that was me, before Christ came and got us. Peace with God for people like that? How is it possible that we should enjoy such heavenly blessing? Who are we to be counted among the saints, to be called children of God, 
to be invited into the Father's presence to even share a meal with Him? But in His mercy, we are. You see the motivation for this peace offering? Even way back with our forefathers in faith? Well, in light of this, how might you bring an offering to the Lord in celebration? Now, we don't have a peace offering. We're not going to pass a plate and say, if, if you enjoy peace with God, throw money in this plate or something like that. But what sort of, of offering might you give the Lord in celebration of the peace that you enjoy with Him? It could certainly be a sacrifice of money. Perhaps you first need to develop the old discipline of meditation. Think on these things. Friends, the, the fight to live holy... The fight to be a thankful Christian. The, the, the fight is in the mind. You have to first meditate on these great truths so that it will motivate you to live in accordance with those thoughts. If you've been forgiven, do you ponder the fruits of that forgiveness? What does it mean to be forgiven with God, friends? One step further, what does it mean to be at peace with God? Tease that out. Think through that, friends. Train your minds. You contemplate the, these, these blessings and, and these, these implications from God's, God's love. You set your mind to thinking on all the restful joy of being restored to God's fellowship. Think with me for a minute. Let's just take, and we're here. Let's do it. Let's think for a moment. If you're in Christ, he will never again look at you with holy hatred. Never will you have His angry glare upon you. It's a staggering thing to think of. If you are in Christ, you'll never be chided by Him. He'll never lash out at you in anger. He'll never send you away. I mean, quite the contrary. He beckons you to come again and again to be in His fellowship, to be in His presence, to come to Him for aid. And when you do, you're not mocked for it. He doesn't browbeat you for taking that long. No, friends, you have this enduring peace with God. And so when you come, you should expect to find grace and mercy there. And that's precisely what you find. Think on these things, friend, and have that motivate you to offer up wise decisions, to offer up pure relationships, holy patterns of behavior to Him. May the peace of God you enjoy inspire you to, to make a, a, a living sacrifice, different portions of your body in whole, but at times these different portions back to Him. May the peace of God inspire you to live morally, to say no to lustful desires, to say no to unkind gestures, to say no to returning uh, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, um, unkindnesses with, with your own unkindnesses to joyfully offer up to him lives of purity and peace towards others. God forgives so we might enjoy peace with him. To try to understand this, to try to milk this for all that it's worth, we looked at the source of peace with God. It flows from forgiveness. And we have now considered the substance of Israel's offering, celebrating peace with God. And finally, we consider how they savored that peace as they enjoyed the offering with God. The sacrifice, as I've said, it was a free will offering. It wasn't prescribed. You did it when you were moved in your heart to do so. There were different reasons one might determine on their own to, to make a peace offering. Chapter 7 speaks of some of those reasons. It might simply be out of thanksgiving to God for dwelling with His people, uh, accepting their, their, their sacrifices and, and peace of being restored to His fellowship. It just might be out of thanksgiving. 
Other reasons for the peace offering might be connected to a solemn vow you were making with God or, or for some other worshipful reason. As you can see, some of these impulses were similar to those given for the grain offering. All three sacrifices we have considered up to this point have been described as food offerings. I don't know if you noticed that. I didn't make much of it in the first two chapters. For example, the burnt offering is described as a food offering in chapter 1 and verse 9, verse 13, verse 17. The grain offering is likewise described in chapter 2 and verse 3 and 10 and 16. And now the peace offering, also three times in our text, verses 5, 9, and 11. What are we to make of this offering being described particularly as a food offering? Well, the burnt offering was only a food offering to the Lord, metaphorically. God didn't sit there and eat it like a sandwich in front of the people, right? So, so the way God would eat, as it were, would be the burning up of an offering on the fire of the altar, right? God needs no food. He needs no sustenance from his creatures. So the motivation was to be with them. To eat in their presence. This was an act of intimacy. Uh, this was a, an act of closeness. And, and even, I, I didn't mention, but the liver and kidneys were offered also to God. This, this, this was bolstered, this intimacy, because those organs in those days were symbolic of a man's will and his emotions. And they're offered to God. They're at peace with God. And so their choices are offered to God. Their deepest emotions were offered to God, and God would eat them, as it were, in joy before them. The grain offering took it one step further. The, the, the burnt offering only God ate. The whole thing was burned on the altar. The grain offering took it one step further, with only a handful of that offering being eaten by the Lord, burned up on the altar. The rest was eaten by the priests, the Lord's representatives, so I guess the Lord ate that as well. But this one's different. This one's different. The peace offering we, we've been considering, um, it, while the fat and blood and, and a couple of these uh, organs were offered to the Lord as part of his meal, chapter 7 and verse 28 reserves the breast meat and the right thigh for the priest to eat. But what about the rest of the animal? Kidney, liver, blood, fat, the breast, one of the thighs. What about the rest of it? I mean, it's described as a food offering, but the rest is unaccounted for. The necessary conclusion, then, is that the family that had brought the offering and even the people that were in the vicinity with them would eat, would share in this rare feast together, together among the people of God and with God. Think of that, friends. We've already talked about the rarity of eating meat in those days, but here was this grand feast that, that sort of just sprung out of the heart of the people that said, I have peace with God. Let us celebrate this over a meal with him. It's astounding when you think of it. God and his people dining together because of the peace that they enjoyed a holy God who condescends to dine with sinners, He comes to save. Those who not only came into God's presence, but pulled up a chair to eat with Him. Imagine how they savored that time. How special, how significant, how unique that was. It was surely a similar experience to when Christ dined at Matthew's house. Remember, he had a bunch of other tax collectors and sinners that were there with him. Them all sitting at table with God come in the flesh. Can you imagine the experience of those outcasts and how they savored it? Fellowshipping with the Savior who was extending peace to them. Peace that was elusive. And if you're in Christ today, if you're part of a local church, you too have savored that intimate peace with God. 
for it is seen in the Lord's Supper that we regularly celebrate. He's present in that meal. And we remember. We remember his sacrifice that brought us peace. And so it is to be in Christ. But you know, not everybody is in Christ. And that may be you here today. If you have yet to turn from your sins and answer the sin problem that is between you and God by by placing your trust in Christ's death to be in substitute for your own, if you have not yet done that, friends, then you don't have peace with God. In fact, your appointment with God that is coming will be anything but peaceful. For you'll be judged for your sins. There'll be no death of another that God will look to. He'll look to you to pay for those sins by dying forever under the heat of his wrath. But that doesn't have to be your fate. Place your trust in Jesus Christ today. Turn from thinking you're going to get out of paying for your sins in some other way. Some bargaining, some arguing with God. Turn and place your trust in Jesus Christ alone to save you. And you will be forgiven. And you will experience peace with God that will never end. But maybe you're already a Christian today. But you haven't been living, you haven't been experiencing the ongoing peace of God. Because you keep cycling back into fleshly uh, uh, responses to things that happen in your life. You keep complaining and, 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 and arguing and despairing and, and these sorts of things, friends. It's not a worthy peace offering. Contemplate again. Put your mind again to what Christ has done to buy your forgiveness, to restore you to God. You have peace with God. You're just shirking it. You're just turning from it. So repent today. And feel the, the, the full weight, the full soaring peace of God today. God forgives so we might enjoy peace with Him. Take some time today and even into the week 